Hidden behind the reflective glass of corporate offices, a new class has come to power. They're penetrating the organizations we work for and making millions in the process. Yet their growth has been so gradual and secretive that we know little about the full extent of their influence. In an era of change, change is their business. Downsizing, right-sizing, re-engineering, their inexorable rise is one of the defining trends of the 20th century organization. They're the management consultants. For the first time, we unveil the discrete world of consultants and gurus and how they affect our lives. Search the internet for the words management consultant. 1,392,328 websites are offered up within seconds. I have to be honest about this, even as a consultant, I keep struggling with this. I don't understand really why the consulting business is growing as rapidly as it is. One of my measures of whether a company was well run or not would be just how much money was spent on outside consultants. If it's a lot, in my view, that company is unlikely to be well run. Good consultants can teach you a lot of things. It is then up to the management of the company not to let them stay forever, kick them out after three months, do not inhale, and above all, do not tuck them round you like a comfort blanket. This is the man who invented a theory held responsible fairly or unfairly for the biggest global rash of job losses since the 1930s. His devastating idea led to redundancies for blue-collar and white-collar workers alike. He describes this theory as the most important economic idea since Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. His name is Michael Hammer. His idea, re-engineering. I think we can begin. My name's Michael Hammer. Appreciate your being here. We're going to work today on the topic of successful SAP implementation. How many Michael Hammer typically charges $70,000 to put on a seminar. His rhetorical technique melds the evangelism of a southern preacher with the delivery of a stand-up comic. Today, financial software company SAP is impressing its clients with an audience with one of the world's most popular management gurus. Uh, and, and the rest of you presumably in the wrong room. Okay, now, the, uh, there are people to whom we say, all we want from you is your best. We don't need anything more than your best. To whom do you say that? All we want is your best. Your kids, exactly, say that to children. Now, you don't mean it, but you say it. <laughs> Why do you say to your kids, just do your best? Why? Because you care about their self-esteem. You care about their social and psychological development. Question, who is actually not interested in your self-esteem and not interested in your social, psychological, or even gastrointestinal development? Who would that be? The customer! The customer is the meanest SOB you're ever gonna meet in your whole life. What does the customer care about? One thing and one thing only, one word. What's that? Results. And if you don't have results and you come to the customer and say, well, I don't have results, but I did my best. <laughs> what does the customer say? Oh, well, in that case, die. The technical definition of re-engineering, which I've been using for 10 years, pretty much without faltering. And since I made up the word, I get to make up the definition is the radical redesign of business processes for dramatic improvement. It's radical change in business processes for dramatic improvement. And there are three key words in there. It's about dramatic improvement, not about slow and steady wins the race. Dramatic improvement. 
Reengineering is not about striving to make things a little bit better. It's about huge quantum leap enhancements. It's about radical change, going back to the root, to the heart, to the clean sheet of paper. Radical is derived from the Latin word radix, which means root, which is also the source for the English word radish, which I'm sure will be of much help to you in your work. <laughs> Reengineering means turning a company on its head. Instead of a traditional pyramid with the chief executive at the top, then directors, middle managers, administrators, and manual workers, Hammer takes as his starting point its product and designs a completely new company structure to support the process of getting that product to the customer. ...goal of creating a value. On this page, we got a process. What do you think we might call that process? That's what I'd call it. I'd call it order fulfillment. That's the name of that process. Here's my question for you. What do you think the main input to a process called order fulfillment <laughs> might be? Would anybody like to hazard a guess as to the input to order fulfillment? Go ahead, take a wild shot. What do you think? Order, what a sly fox you are. Go ahead. There are a lot of companies that have had encrustments of old ways of doing things, times have changed, and they have the equivalent of a legacy business system. And the idea of, of taking key pieces, stepping back and figuring out how to reorganize it in ways that are compelling and fit where you think the future is going to be is a very powerful idea. Hundreds of business books are written every year, but Michael Hammer and James Champney's 1990 manifesto for a business revolution captured a mood and fitted the economic climate. So much so that by 1994, two-thirds of top companies in Britain and America had embarked on a re-engineering project. I came across re-engineering, um, Mike Hammer and Champy's book, um, by accident almost. I was working in London and going back to see my wife at the weekends. And I was early for the train and I went in the bookshop and I saw this book called The Re-engineering the Corporation written by Champy and Hammer. And I bought it, because I buy books, you know, well, that looks like a good critique, yes, I'll buy that. Don't really know what's in it, but I'll buy it. Not knowing anything about it. I went home and I read it on the train, and I spent the weekend and I read it twice uh, over the weekend, which is a bit unusual, because I hadn't seen my wife all week, but I didn't speak to her because I was busy reading this book. And the reason I read it was because it said so much about what we were trying to do. It showed you about being effective and being efficient. I came back to London on Monday morning, went in the same bookshop, bought all the copies of the book that they had, and gave them out to the staff on the Monday and said, this is what we're doing, read it, we're going to work to this thing. Harry Molson had worked for British Gas since the 80s, first as an engineer, then in charge of the pipeline section Transco. When Harry took over as managing director, he had a tough job ahead of him. Transco had been part of a comfortable monopoly, unaffected by competition since the war. But in 1994, the government warned British Gas to prepare for competition within three years. The most resistant part of an organization is not the front lines. The people who do the real work. They usually are close enough to the action to know what's going on, they recognize it's in the customer's interests and their personal interests over the long run to really improve how things are done. The place where you get pushback and resistance is from the managerial ranks. And I really believe that the leadership of a company has to be ruthless in dealing with the managerial ranks. I often say that re-engineering is a revolution of the top and the bottom against the middle. They're the ones that need the strongest crowbar to pry them out of the past. And yes, I call that a reversal of the Industrial Revolution. It's about taking a vertically oriented organization that's focused narrowly up to one that's horizontal, focusing out toward the customer. When I took over Transco, we had 13 levels between the guy who dug the holes in the road and myself. 13 levels of management. Unnecessary. Why do you need 13 levels of management? Under Molson, Transco's organizational structure was simplified from an unwieldy 64 regional divisions to just four. Management layers were cut from 13 to six. The biggest impact that re-engineering has had is what it's done to the productivity of companies 
and consequently its role in the turnaround of the U.S. economy in the last eight years and the spectacular rise in the stock market. Many of the companies that have achieved great heights have done so through the application of re-engineering. We can see that across many industries. So to the man in the street, he or she may still have a job because of re-engineering. His or her standard of living is likely to be higher than it was because of re-engineering and also may have made money in the stock market as a result. We went from 36,000 to 16,000 in three years. Not by hard means, not by difficult means, but by chopping out of it all those things which didn't mean anything from a customer's point of view. Getting rid of the rubbish, as I called it, getting rid of the bureaucratic rubbish, and trying to implement systems that made it better. If you're going for a whole reconstruction of a company, it's actually very hard to know which parts of the company are essential to its culture and which are peripheral. And sometimes I suspect you know, we will have improved the effectiveness of the organisation. Other times we have torn the heart out of it without actually realising that that's what we've done. Abraham Lincoln had a riddle. He used to ask people, if you call a horse's tail a leg, how many legs does the horse have? And the answer was four. Calling the tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. So calling downsizing re-engineering don't make it re-engineering. In fact, re-engineering doesn't have as a primary goal the elimination of jobs. It's about elimination of wasted time and effort. Does re-engineering destroy jobs? Yes, it destroys pointless non-value adding jobs which generate costs and don't do anything for customers. But it also creates jobs. It creates meaningful value adding work that adds value to the customer and consequently is successful for the organization as a whole. Eileen Shapiro is a former management consultant with the elite strategy firm McKinsey & Co. She now runs her own company in Boston, Massachusetts, and although still a consultant herself, she is critical of managers' use of consultants and of some of the claims made by consultants and gurus alike. If you read the introduction to Reengineering the Corporation, Michael Hammer's book, what he says is, he and Champy say, is re-engineering is the first real answer since Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, which is 200 years ago. Everything else has just been a fad. It's crazy thinking. Reengineering is one of the best of the, of the fads. And one of the ways I define it as the Consultants Full Employment Act, and it really has been. It spawned just in, an enormous amount of work extremely lucrative work for many consultants in many countries. I think my greatest mistake in all was somehow not negotiating a commission on all the consulting fees that were generated out of the concept of re-engineering. Consultants latched on to the concept of re-engineering and built it into major businesses for themselves. I've lost track of the amount that the consulting industry has made in this enterprise. It's well in the billions of dollars. We have to be good at spotting what's going to happen. What is the next wave? We're always searching from that, OK, we've managed to help clients with this topic in this way, but is this going to continue to be the right topic and are there better ways? So there's, it's what we call pushing back the envelope. We're always trying to push back the envelope and I think that makes the world a better place. You can write a mission statement. You can re-engineer. You can total quality management yourself. And then if you decide that re-engineering really was the wrong way to go, you can grow your way into success. Um, you can downsize. You can right size. Um, really, it's just the, the imagination for phrases that limits you in the kinds of things that you can do to insulate yourself from actually thinking about what the problem is and what you have to do to fix it. Management consultants have been described as the witch doctors of the modern era. It's a profession with no set rules, no governing association, no barriers to entry, and no official penalties when things go wrong. It's an industry that was worth more than $40 billion last year, and it's still growing. Over the last decade, it's been growing at about 16% per year on average. So just since 1992, the, the industry has more than doubled. And this is phenomenal growth when we look at what the overall growth of the global economy is. 
it's a secretive world where the commodity is as intangible as the industry itself. It's a business where the starting salary can be as much as $100,000 a year, rising to more than $1 million for a senior partner. The best known is McKinsey & Co. It's an elite collegiate international partnership. The biggest is Anderson Consulting, one of the few consultancies to advertise. With a turnover of $8.3 billion last year, its revenues are greater than the gross domestic product of a small country. But Anderson Consulting can help it employs 63,000 consultants worldwide. So when you reach for the moon, you might actually get it. Lots and lots of people apply to us. I mean, staggering numbers of people apply to us, so a lot of effort goes into the interviewing and sifting through. I think on a worldwide basis, something like three million people applied to us last year, which is which when I heard the number, I fell off my chair. But when you think about it, I suppose it's natural given the size. The enormous size of Anderson is driven largely by information technology. IT now accounts for two-thirds of the growth in consulting. Management techniques like re-engineering rely on IT to allow companies to rationalize. And for the consultant, rationalization leads not to redundancy, but to renaissance. The US has been through this wave after wave after wave of so-called downsizing or re-engineering, partially as a result of this, this phenomena of, of, uh, of productivity improvement and changing ways of, of working. And yet the unemployment rate in the United States is, is now the lowest that it's been in 30 years. Modern consulting was born at the turn of the century. The Industrial Revolution had drawn thousands of laborers to huge workshops, but the factory floor was still run in the traditional way by the craftsmen themselves. The man who changed all that, and the grandfather of modern consulting, is Frederick Taylor. He spent 26 years refining a method of parceling up work into simple, measurable tasks, speeding up production and improving productivity. He conducted experiments in standardizing jobs, getting rid of wasted time and effort, rewarding workers who could keep up, and getting rid of those who could not. His revolutionary work method was called scientific management. Mr. Taylor was a severe individual but the great irony was that the guy who ended up inventing modern bureaucracy in a way, Mr. Taylor with his stopwatch and time and motion studies, intended to liberate people. In the late 19th century, craftsmen decided how a job should be done and by whom. Factories were noisy and chaotic, products piled up and production was often slow and uneconomic. Taylor's new system of time and motion meant that planning could be transferred from the shop floor to the management. Cheaper, less skilled workers would do only what they were told. Taylorism was to set workers and management apart for a century. In countries where workers were relatively skilled, it's a de-skilling of the work process because in a way, everything's become much more mechanical. What Frederick Taylor was trying to do is trying to sort of analyze this, the production process in a scientific way by looking at how people, for example, were laying bricks. He measured the time 
with the stopwatch to find out how long it should take a good worker to perform each of these specific motions. It also tried to optimize the way people work, to look at the movements of people and see how the movements could be reduced or made more efficient so people would work more efficiently in a specific time. Taylor said, in the past, man has been first. In the future, the system will be first. The hard issues of what F.W. Taylor called the, the best way of doing the job, elimination of waste, continuous improvement, gathering in of people's knowledge, they're still with us. The great difference now is that as far as F.W. Taylor was concerned, the thinking belonged to the managers and the bosses and workers were paid to do, not to think. If you look at the U.S. part of the history, most of scientific management, we've driven the life out of people, driven the passion out of people, driven the passion out of products, and it's an awful thing, but basically it had to happen. Henry Ford took Taylorism a step further with the introduction of the production line process for the Model T Ford. This time the parts moved past the worker, rather than the worker moving to the parts. The cars began coming off the assembly line at the rate of one every 40 seconds. And what Henry Ford had foreseen happened. Mass production and the assembly line drove the price of the Model T down from $850 to $300. Now everybody could have one. The first to see consulting in a way as a trade, as a business, and to do this very successfully at a very large scale was Charles Badeau. He was a Frenchman who never completed his secondary school education, but left for the United States instead, where he's looking for a get-rich-quick scheme. And after several attempts, he finally succeeded uh, as a consultant. He had seen consultants at work, and he thought it was a good idea, and then he set out to sell his own system of scientific management. So in a way, he came up with what could be called a proprietary system of scientific management, and that was the Beddow system. And that Beddow system standardized any task in the factory uh, according to the so-called B value. In 1926, Beddow set up his first European office in London. British companies embraced his system. It was simple. A B unit was based on the number of minutes in an hour. Each worker should be able to achieve a certain number of units in an hour and was paid accordingly. At the age of 90, Nelson Mitten prefers the quieter game. As one of Charles Beddow's production engineers, he was the man with the stopwatch and the clipboard. I said, I am going to use a stopwatch. We're going to time you. I said, more than that, I want you to work absolutely naturally because this is going to help all of us. It's going to help the factory, it's going to help your factory survive, it's going to create more work because we can, when we're timing, see little bits of work which are not effective, which ought to be cut out, and we could make some of the work easier for you. Now, a stopwatch was not highly regarded before the war. In fact, the trade unions viewed it with very considerable suspicion. But it was a new thing. They were convinced it was going to lead to redundancies. But all these small changes only came about as a byproduct of our reorganization of the department. What we needed was to increase the versatility of our existing machines and tools so that unskilled men could use them. In the States, companies like Ford passed on their efficiency savings to the workforce in the form of higher wages. But in the UK, there were strikes when scientific management was used as an excuse to de-skill workers and cut their pay. People didn't like being timed, honestly. It showed some up. I mean, some of them were doing such low ratings, it was embarrassing. Beddow came over here with an American multinational, Kodak, for which he had introduced the B system in their US factories, and then Kodak also asked Beddow to introduce the B system in the British factories. Multinationals were very important because they built 
bridges for these consultants to go outside of their home country. And so Edo very often initially in Europe worked with American multinationals. You were given very good training. You told what to wear, what sort of ties to put on, how to be polite people, how to be on time and never be too early, never be late, those sort of things. But don't go around telling everybody you work for Bideau because the unions are after you. The answer was, if somebody asks you what you are, if it's confidential, say, well, my mother thinks I'm pianist in the local brothel, but actually I work for Bideau. <laughs> that was the sort of humour that went at the beginning. It was a racket. You either succeeded or didn't. You could, could get into trouble too. The success of Charles Bideau was partly due to the need for standardised work measurement, but also to his tremendous salesmanship and connections with the heads of industry and high society. He was very successful socially. He organised a lot of parties. He actually bought in the 1920s a chateau in the Loire Valley in France, uh, refurbished that completely and hosted quite a lot of social events. He actually hosted also the wedding of the former King Edward VIII with Wallace Simpson in this chateau. What was more important for the Beddow Consultancy was the fact that subsequently Beddow organised the, the highly controversial trip of the Duke to Nazi Germany. It may have been that, like Edward VIII, Beddow felt he could help broker peace. However, the trip to Nazi Germany was an embarrassment to the British government and to the monarchy. Edward's detractors said he was either a Nazi sympathiser or a dupe, manipulated into creating a propaganda coup for Hitler. Beto, in a way, felt he was apolitical. He was not interested in politics. He was interested in improving efficiency. After going to Nazi Germany, the Duke wanted to visit the United States. And again, Beto prepared that visit. He went to the United States, but trade unions there used this incident, the fact that Beddow now was associated with the Nazis, to stage a campaign which was directed against Beddow, but against the speed up of scientific management and methods like Beddow's in general, which meant that there was a lot of controversy, um, a lot of bad press for Beddow. In Paris, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor filled the public eye again as they cancelled their trip to the United States. Unfriendly comment from American labour is said to be the cause of their change in plan. In Washington, Charles E. Beddow, the shorter man, disliked by labor as the inventor of an efficiency system, intimates his regret that his friendship should embarrass the Duke. What had worked so well for Beddow in the early 30s worked against him as war loomed. His association with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor made his consultancy unpopular in Britain. He was forced to give up his shareholding and the company changed its name. During the war, he worked with the Vichy government in France and with Nazi backing, planned to build a Trans-Sahara railroad across North Africa. There he was arrested, and because he was still an American citizen, was accused of treason. Badeau committed suicide before his trial. When war came along... Nobody quite knew what was going to happen to man's consultancy. Some thought we might all go out of business. In fact, war created new opportunities. There was a shortage of skilled workers and a brand new workforce. 1939 to 1942. And what has been the biggest new factor in these years of war effort? Why women's part in it? In the factories, they represent 35% of all labor. The war was a, a very important period for consultancy, especially in Britain, because it became very important to improve efficiency, because most of the men had to go um, to fight in the war. And some of them 
quite a few of them were replaced by women, which were less skilled. The consultants could be of major assistance because they were there to improve efficiency and scientific management was geared very much towards unskilled labour because it prescribed to people exactly what to do, which movements to carry out in which time. Management consultancy was regarded as a great essential, accepted and backed by the government, and I think Sir Stafford Cripps was largely that. And even during the war, we grew. In this factory, you're taking part in one of the most important offensive operations against the enemy. The work which each one of you puts in each day is an essential part of every bombing raid that takes place. When war started, I was working in Newcastle and I got sent to Norwich because there was a great sh shortage of battle dresses. Every job you got was rated in bees. There would be so many bees for putting the left sleeve in, so many bees for putting the right sleeve in, so many bees for putting the collar on. And if you average anything over 60 an hour, you add it to your basic wage up to a rate of about 80. In short, it was a very successful operation. We raised a fit, nearly double efficiency with the same number of 1,500 girls, and that made an immense contribution. After the war, consulting went from strength to strength. The end of rationing meant that factories could not keep up with demand, and consultants had shown that they could improve productivity. No doubt we are in a bit of a tough spot, and it'll take a year or two to get out. But we've done it before, and we can do it again. We shall only get it right if we can produce much more than we did before the war. That's the only way we can get the things we need. Voices spanning the Atlantic link the old world with the new. New York. But it was America that was to provide the industry with a kickstart. British consultants had been productivity engineers involved in work study. The new American buzzword was strategy. And the company which brought it to the UK was McKinsey. The man who brought McKinsey to London was Hugh Parker. Of course, the first thing I had to do was to try to get to be known in England. And I devoted the next 10 years of my life intensively to doing just that. I made it my business to be seen and heard, and I, I made speeches, I wrote, wrote articles. I, I was, my, my whole time was, was spent getting to be known and recognized. And after several years, this began to work. An Anglophile, Parker had been in the British Army in Burma during the war. 
Ten years after setting up McKinsey in London, he appeared on the BBC. Now, you've worked already with a lot of Britain's major companies. You're working at the moment, indeed, with the BBC. Uh, what is now your assessment of British management compared, for example, with American? I think the difference, probably, is in, in the numbers, in other words, in, in the quantity. I think that British management as a whole, I'm taking the, the, uh, the industry and uh, management as a class, is lacking in numbers of men who really master the tools of their trade, who are fully qualified to do the work that they are uh, expected to do, and know the techniques uh, to do that. This is London, England. We shall tell you who the Britons are, where they are, and how you should treat them socially, commercially. Consultants have always aspired to establish close links with what you could call a business and a social elite in each of the countries. And that again becomes very important when McKinsey comes to Britain. Once we really got going in England, and this would be mid to late 1960s, 10 years after we opened an office there, we were really you know, on a roll. McKinsey's became all the rage amongst British institutions. They advised the Bank of England, Sussex University, and the Atomic Energy Commission. The deference to the American consultants was such that they were even invited onto the committee that reformed the National Health Service in 1971. McKinsey's were brought in uh, by the then government to completely reorganize the formal management structure of the NHS. And of course that was back in the days when, you know, the corporatist approach uh, was in vogue. And it was thought that you could bring in a company like that to literally completely design a set of management arrangements for an organisation as big as the NHS, which employs a million people. McKinsey advised on the nationalisation of British Steel in 1967. Their consultants were there again in the 1980s, preparing it for privatisation. One of the nice things that people sometimes get the opportunity to do in the consulting business is to collect fees on the way in and to collect fees on the way out. When McKinsey first came to Britain, external advice was a novelty. Management was considered to need a helping hand. Yet 30 years later, when British boardrooms are full of leaders with business degrees, there are more consultants than ever. 90% of the top 300 British companies used management consultants last year. It's, it's hard to predict. I, I remember in the, um, in the 1970s, uh, when this great explosion of MBA graduates uh, came upon the world, and, and it, was, uh, it was held by some consultants and some consulting firms that G consultants were, were obsolete because now managers were going to be so well-trained that they were not going to need the sort of technical skills of consultants. Whereas what happened was just the opposite. The, the, the rate of change, the rate of... Uh, uh, discontinuity has become so great that consulting has just grown and grown and grown. I just think they're opportunists um, who um, have found the niche uh, in, in the market. Good luck to them because they're, they're glorified sales people that, that go into companies um, and uh, basically sit down and listen to what the management have to say and then end up writing a report which reflects um, what, the, what, what the management says inside the company. Lloyd's insurance market faced an unprecedented crisis in 1988. Eight billion pounds of losses in five years. Send for McKinsey. The problems were enormous. The scale was huge. And it was inconceivable that we could possibly have in-house enough brain power to deal with the problems. It involved, quite literally, billions and billions of pounds and the need to resolve losses that have been made through a number of catastrophes and old year dilemmas uh, of really very large scale. Uh, we needed a great deal of help and we got it from outstanding the good people working with us. In 1996, the Granada Group, led by Jerry Robinson, won a £3.8 billion hostile takeover battle for Forte. Within a year, Robinson produced £100 million in extra profits, including a slice from downsizing the consultants. A lot of consultants used within, within Forte, a lot, of, a lot of money spent on consultancy. My own view was not to much effect, because actually, in the end, it was a company that was not, uh, not well run, and the result of our own management of it without consultants have been certainly far more effective than, uh, than it was before. What's happening in a lot of companies now in the U.S., and I believe in Europe, is that middle managers have figured out that they are more likely to get what they want by bringing in a consultant 
being able to say that X, Y, Z said to do such and such, and then having it done that way as opposed to doing the work themselves, making the recommendation themselves, executing it and living with it. It's a very dysfunctional way. I sometimes think, and this is not kind, uh, that it's managerial Prozac. If there's one organization that epitomizes the growing reliance on management consultants over the last 30 years, it is the BBC. Its close relationship with McKinsey goes back to 1965. The man in charge of the first BBC study was Roger Morrison, another American. The challenge was to bring the disciplines of private industry to bear on a public service. And where better to test their analysis than on one of the BBC's most popular dramas? Really? Good evening. Uh, do good. Uh, Mr. Hudson's expecting me. Oh, yes, Mr. David. I'll just, uh, just tell him you're here. We worked with the team on Zedcar looking at what could they do to plan and manage the process of creating a television drama or television program in the most effective, effective manner. What do you get? No, thanks. Uh, we undertook a study which resulted in uh, very similar kinds of recommendations to those that were uh, being used uh, for industrial companies. In other words, first of all, to set up and delegate responsibility for the different business streams, if you want to call television a business. And so television was set up as a separate uh, unit. The radio business was set up as a separate uh, unit. And of course, international, uh, the overseas, was set up as a separate unit. Two studio! I don't and the early McKinsey team went a good deal wider, looking to centralize and reduce the role of the BBC's regional operations. Its report advised against the building of new studios in Manchester, but fashions change, and now regionalism is high up the agenda. Many at the top of the corporation were skeptical of the McKinsey model, seeing an inevitable tension between business methods and creativity. Bill Cotton was head of light entertainment when the BBC first brought in McKinsey. The core activity was the, the making of programs for this country and the transmission of those programs on our two networks. That, I think, was what created a, a problem for McKinsey's. Uh, you know, the BBC was a spending organisation. It wasn't an earning organisation. Certainly, in most of the exercises that I can recall, which is a long time ago, people were very enthusiastic that were involved in it. Now, there are undoubtedly lots of other people who were carping about, why are we doing this? but they didn't understand the problem that Lord Hill had, uh, which was not very much more money for license fees, because they were too far away from the real world of bringing money in to pay their salaries. In the new integrated newsroom at White City Center, staff work side by side, making both TV and radio, whatever their background, to share the new technology on McKinsey advice. 30 years earlier, Roger Morrison had argued for their separation to move control of resources closer to program makers. BBC insiders are concerned that cost savings are driving the latest plans. I think that was because it is, in accountants' terms, an obvious way of saving a very great deal of money. And in creative terms? I think in creative terms it's very damaging. I went to the BBC at a moment when John Burke was just really beginning his revolution of the management and the structures of BBC. And at that time, the influence of McKinsey was enormous. For most of the past decade, McKinsey has actually staffed its own office in the BBC. But it is not the only firm involved. The list of the BBC's external advisors is a who's who of consultancy firms in Britain. They have helped draft the major policy documents of recent years, documents which have defined the very structure of the corporation. Managers complain that a consultant is always there at their elbow. I believe that there was a crisis of confidence in the BBC, partly driven by the external agenda, partly internally induced. Um, there was a, a lack of belief uh, amongst governors, amongst senior management that the management was really up to it there and so then came a whole era of second guessing for our consultants. Look at the proportions, look at the size and the complexity of this business and also look at 
the huge changes the BBC has been going through during the last five years. Radical changes in the organization structure, radical changes in technology, outsourcing of uh, a great deal of services hitherto done in-house. All of these are things that uh, legitimately benefit from an outside view. Broadcasting House in central London was once full of studios and programme makers. Now it is home to the expensive offices of managers and policy strategists. Concern about the BBC's use of consultants has even reached the House of Lords, raised by former Governor P.D. James. My Lords, the BBC is not managed by the Director General and his colleagues without outside assistance. It would be interesting to know how many millions of licensed payers' money has been spent in the last five years on the professional and highly expensive consultants and advisors who have apparently become essential to the running of our national institutions. I suspect that the figure is somewhere in the annual accounts, but I have never been able to find it. BBC spending on consultants does not appear in its annual report. In fact, it is some £20 million a year, more than 200,000 licences, half on strategic consultants alone. A half percent, roughly £10 million a year, out of our licence fee income of over £2 billion on strategic consultants. Now, that's in line with what other major corporations would spend. It's probably a little lower than many I can think of. But that's only strategic consultants. How much do you spend on other consultants? Another half of 1% perhaps? Overall? Certainly not more. Yes. So all forms of external advice, 1% uh, of, of, of licensee revenue would certainly cover it. Uh, it would probably be below 1%. Yes, yes, yes. All forms of external advice. Yes. Why has the, in the past the BBC rarely revealed uh, the actual amount you spend on consultants? Well, we were probably a little coy about it, but I don't think we have any reason to be ashamed of that number. What I want to do is, from my perspective as a consultant, I want to explain as simply as possible what constitutes success. The BBC is not the only public service organisation to rely on the advice of outsiders. The civil service has been a big spender too, and the NHS recently spent £200 million on consultants in a single year. In this Home Office seminar, civil servants are being taught the best ways of using consultants by a consultant. The words that I would use to describe uh, success, a successful relationship, are words like permanence. I certainly do not mean that we set up camp uh, in Whitehall, but what I do mean is that a government department doesn't just pick up the phone to me when they have a problem. I would like the government departments to pick up the phone and say, have you got any thinking about this? Is there any relevance of your experience in other sectors that might help us think about this? I doubt you would find a major firm of consultants that would not be willing to engage in discussion with you to help explore what that might mean. One of the things that is important is that the management consultants themselves uh, are very aware that they need to provide a good service, that they are, their reputation is on stake with every job that they do, and they need to put their best foot forward. We all want to be associated with success, and success needs to be clearly identified what constitutes success at the beginning and measured as the assignment evolves. But it is, of course, a risk that you could have if you, if you were innocent and the, and the firm was so inclined not to, uh, to, to, to offer you a good service, that, that they would offer you the sort of senior partner for their beauty contest, and then all you'd see was, was junior staff later on. Now, one of the rules I think anyone has to follow is be absolutely clear who will be working with you, what time you will get, and who you can, that you can bring in the most senior people if you think it's going wrong. The market-led Thatcher reforms of the late 80s were a bonanza for consultants. Suddenly, the private sector knew best. Accounting firms like Arthur Anderson, KPMG, Coopers and Pricewaterhouse set up lucrative consulting arms. After all, who better to bring private sector wisdom to the public sector than the consultant? I personally find it much more frustrating to work with government, even though inevitably uh, on some problems one would have to but government's record in managing things is not very good. I think the civil service went through a period, probably like a lot of organizations in the 80s, when whenever they had a problem, their first knee-jerk reaction was to think, 
let's bring in the management consultants. And then we were doing that. And I think a bad experience is one where you are not focused on the problem you wish to solve. You know you've got a problem, but you don't know what the outside organisation can contribute. And they come in, and there are some bad practitioners as well as some truly excellent ones. They come in and they ask you what answer you want them to come up with, and then they tell it to you at great cost. Just to tip you off, one thing I've seen happen is that we've engaged somebody on a daily rate basis, let's say £1,400 a day, and then when the actual contracts come through, or maybe even when the invoices come through, the £1,400 a day has been converted to £200 an hour, and we're being charged for nine hours a day, which is £1,800 a day. You have to remember that all, all advice, whether it's a consultancy or, or anything else, it's, it's selling you something. It's an attempt to sell their business. And therefore, they're, you know, in all of their pitches, they're going to try and make themselves you know, seem absolutely vital to your decision-making process. I have never found that to be the case. But why do we use management consultants? Trusted advisors to, to our senior managers, stores of knowledge and expertise, all good stuff. And then I was reading one of my Dilbert books the other night, and most people know Dilbert now, and the Dilbert definition went something along, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, but of course, that's not true. It's not true at all. Take that off quickly. Um, but this is a serious slide after the last one. This is one I, I do mean. Um, what you get out of management consultants and out of that expenditure is up to you. If they don't deliver, it's in 99.9% .9 of cases, it's your fault. I think management consultants have been hugely influential on the rest of us because they are influencing what companies do, how they work, and why they do it. I think the ultimate impact on the negative side might be even greater because except for in entrepreneurial companies, we are now raising a generation of managers who don't know how to take risk and make decisions. And I can't think of anything that is more scary for business in a capitalist society. Okay, who else do we like to blame? Consultants, excellent, the consultants, they say, oh, the consultants are incompetent, which is a really new idea. Uh, good. <laughs> In fact, who's to blame? Executive leadership of the organization. The management of the organization for misunderstanding it, for misconstruing it, for mismanaging it, and for abdicating their responsibility and treating it like just another shrink wrap installation. If you manage it that way, you deserve what you get. Occasionally, Channel 4 has been known to employ the odd consultant too, but nothing like on the scale of the BBC. Yet. We've had an hour of your time. How much do you charge for an hour of your time and your thoughts? Much more than it's worth. <laughs> Dr. Hammer, thank you very much. You skillfully avoided that one.